Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Computer Security, Defensive Techniques. So in the last video, we saw lots of ways your computer can get attacked. What sort of things can we do to protect ourselves? Um, so that's what this video is all about. So the first thing I want to talk about is firewalls. Um, we'll talk about corporate firewalls first, and then we'll talk about personal firewalls. Um, so first of all, let's consider what happens if we have a company with no firewall. Um, so we've got a company internal intranet, and every computer in the intranet can access the internet. This means that all our computers are vulnerable to attacks from outside. It also means potentially... You know, we've got somebody who wants to do something internally, uh, like maybe we've got somebody who's spying, they can send information out of the company. There's no controls at all. So this is this is clearly a bad situation. So what a firewall computer is, is it's a computer that stands between the corporate intranet and the wider internet. So uh, it's going to prevent malicious traffic from going into the company, it can also prevent malicious information from going out of the company. There's a variety of different things that the firewall can do. So one thing it could do is it can block specific applications or it could alternatively whitelist certain applications. So basically it's gonna be looking at all the traffic coming in and let's say somebody's trying to uh, access like FTP on one of our computers, it'll be like, hey, that computer's not supposed to be doing file transfer. I don't know why you're why you're trying to access that computer and try and file transfer from it. Or it could be, um, what we'll, we'll talk about in a minute about uh, which computers are actually allowed to access the internet. But uh, you know, it could say, oh, that's not the right computer to be accessing files from. So this looks kind of suspicious. Um, it can either block certain IP numbers or whitelist certain IP numbers. So, uh, you know, we can limit which computers either employees can access or we can limit which of our computers outsiders can access. Um, it can also scan for, for information in uh, incoming or outgoing um, traffic. So I actually work for a, a company. I was actually a visiting researcher at IBM Federal Systems. And uh, we were not allowed to use our computers, including our email for private purposes. And I was told that they actually would scan the emails to look for words like football in the email because that was a sign that you were using your emails for personal purposes. Um, this was just on the cusp when normal non-computer scientists were starting to use email. And I actually told them that I did not think that this uh, policy was going to fly with the next generation of graduates, but uh, uh, they said that the government contracts they were on uh, did not allow the use of on-site computers for personal email. Anyway. All right. Uh, so as I alluded to a minute ago, um, if you want to get a little bit fancier, what you can do is you have all the internal computers um, sending all their traffic through the firewall computer, which is protecting both from outside influences and people on the inside doing things they shouldn't, uh, and sending that information outside of the intranet. But you've also got a series of additional computers, uh, such as web servers or file servers, which are given direct access to the internet. So like, let's say we've got a uh, product that we have and we've got some, you know, maybe some updates or patches uh, that we have a file server that people can go, go ahead and download those from. You know, those would be clearly something that um, people from outside of our company should be able to access. Similarly, the web server, that's obviously something people should be able to access. And so, um, a more sophisticated ar architecture says that we've got these a special uh, set of computers or a smaller sub-network that's referred to as the DMZ. Um, this is short for demilitarized zone, uh, which is a general term, but it's probably most widely known for the DMZ between North and South Korea. So the idea is, you know, we've got, uh, I suppose we're South Korea in this, in this scenario. Um, and we've got that demilitarized zone that's uh, carefully protected. Um, and then there's the Wild West outside, which is the internet. Okay, um, modern 
computers also have a personal firewall. So um, even though you know some of you will be working for companies uh, that have firewalls, but you all have computers. Um, many of you have, well, I suppose all of you have computers that you use for personal purposes, not for work purposes. So uh, there is what's referred to as a personal firewall. This is uh, generally part of the operating system at this point. And so the personal firewall is going to act similarly to what we just saw a minute ago with the corporate firewall. So first of all, let's take a look at the situation with no firewall. With no firewall, all of your programs just communicate directly with the internet. And the internet communicates directly with your programs. What the personal firewall does is, uh, again, typically part of the operating system, this is going to act as an intermediary where all traffic from programs on your computer need to go through the personal firewall and the personal firewall will either say, yeah, okay, you're authorized to send this information out or I don't know what you're doing. You're not allowed to send information out. And so the idea here is, let's say something gets installed on your computer that shouldn't, like let's say you ran a treasure horse or something um, and now you've got this program that's a key logger. Uh, hopefully the personal firewall will prevent that key logger from sending information out to the hacker. Um, you know, the, it will try and send information on the internet and hopefully the personal firewall will be like, um, you're not, you're not allowed to send information off of the computer. So I don't know what you're doing, but I'm go not going to let you do it. Uh, similarly, uh, people are constantly trying to get onto the computer, uh, particularly if, you, if you've got a server that's running 24 hours a day. Um, I've talked to different students at RCCs in the dorms who are in charge of the computers in the dormitories um, who've run servers before. And they say that it's surprising how many times their computers get hit by people trying to get on. So um, what the personal firewall does in the opposite direction is it only allows packets through that are uh, for services that you are currently using. So, you know, like my computers don't use FTP. They're not acting as FTP servers. So if somebody were to try and access my computer using the secure FTP protocol, my firewall should say, um, we're not a secure uh, FTP server. I don't know why you think you're accessing it, but clearly your traffic is unwanted. Uh, you are most likely to run it to the personal firewall. You used to have to turn these on explicitly, but uh, at this point, I think all the operating systems are, are running them uh, by default. You are most likely to run into the firewall when you install a new program. So typically what would happen is if you're installing a program that needs to use the internet, like let's say, I hear there's this cool new game and uh, you know my friends want me to play with them, so I go ahead and install on my computer. Well, in order for me to play this game with my friends, um, it needs to send information off of my computer. So uh, the firewall software would say, okay, Patrick, you're trying to run this game and uh, it's asking if it can send information out to the internet. Should I go ahead and approve access to the internet for this particular program? And then you can say yes. Um, I have noticed that a surprising number of programs these days seem to want access to the internet. My suspicion is many of them want access to the internet for update purposes, which is a good thing generally, but it's not always clear. So, um, yeah, I don't have any great suggestions, but certainly if you have things asking for access to the internet and it's not something that you think you installed, at minimum, you should go ahead and Google it. Sometimes it will be part of a pre-existing program. So for example, um, I run Adobe products. That's how I'm making this video right now. Um, and this diagram you're looking at, this was created in Photoshop. This video you're listening to right now is being done with Adobe Premiere. Adobe installs a whole bunch of junk on your computer. I'm sure it all does something, but like I run into it when, for example, I try and shut down the computer and it won't shut down because these Adobe things will not stop running. And I'm like, I don't know what those things are. They're not the names of the applications. And it turns out they're like helper uh, programs that Adobe has installed. So uh, it's certainly possible for something to get installed on your computer. 
and ask for access to the internet and actually be legitimate. But definitely Google it. If, if you're not sure what it is, you don't remember installing something super recently, or even if you do, and that's not what's asking to access the internet, you should double check it. Um, anyway, so that's the personal firewall. Okay, our next topic is proxy servers. So a uh, proxy server is used to um, basically allow somebody who is trying to access a resource and they aren't able to access that resource directly, access it anyway. Um, so uh, I'm gonna use an example where we're trying to access something that we can normally access from Stanford. Um, but there's a couple other situations where this could be used and I'll talk about those in a minute. Okay, so uh, let's say there's a restricted resource that Stanford pays for. So for example, um, if you're looking for books on computer science, you're trying to learn a new programming language, you wanna learn more about HTML and CSS, um, as a Stanford affiliate, you have access to Safari Online, which provides a vast number of books on a wide range of computer-related topics. It's actually a really great resource. So, uh, if I try and access Safari Online and I'm on campus, what happens is Safari Online um, can look at who's trying to access it and it can say, oh, that's a Stanford computer. Stanford is allowed to access uh, our, our resources. So I'm gonna go ahead and let that request go through. So that works, that's great. And then somebody else on campus tries to access it, same thing. And so what it's really doing is it's looking at the IP numbers. And as we all know now, uh, IP numbers for Stanford computers all have the same uh, initial prefix numbers. And so it's pretty easy for a, a computer like Safari Online servers to tell, oh, this is a Stanford computer. Now, suppose I am no longer uh, on campus, I'm at home. What is gonna happen? Um, now, if you live on campus, you're still golden. But if you're not living on campus, that's kind of a problem. And so what Stanford does to support those of us who are not living on campus is they run what's called a proxy server. And the way the proxy server is going to work is, OK, so let's say um, I'm not using the proxy server. I am trying to access this resource from my computer, which is on Comcast. What happens is. I access that resource directly from my computer at home and the resource says, Safari Online says, I don't know who you are. I don't recognize your IP number. What's your credit card number? So that doesn't work unless you buy a personal account. Obviously, if you, if you create a personal uh, Safari Online account and pay for it with your own credit card, that they'd be happy to do that. But you can't use the... Stanford access because you're not a Stanford computer. So what we're gonna do here is, instead of accessing our restricted resource directly, instead we're gonna access it through the proxy server. So we will send our request to the proxy server. The proxy server will send the request onto the restricted resource. The restricted resource will look at the IP number where that request is coming from and it'll say, oh, it's coming from our proxy. It doesn't necessarily know it's a proxy server, but it says, oh, it's coming from a Stanford IP number because the proxy server is a Stanford IP number. The Stanford server is on Stanford campus. And it says, okay, that's fine. And so it will send the results back to the proxy server and the proxy server will go ahead and send the data back on to me. So um, Stanford does run a proxy server and this is how you can access a variety of different resources. Uh, what are some other uses of proxy servers? Well, um, I mentioned earlier about working for a company that did not want us to use computers for uh, personal purposes. Another thing that that uh, Firewall can do is it can block access to things like Sports Illustrated, or like let's say there's the Stanford Cal games going on and you're stuck at work and you're working over the weekend. You're like, I feel like I should be able to access this anyway. Well, what you can do and be super careful about this because um, IT can get really pissed off and your company can get really pissed off. So don't do this unless you're sure your boss is okay with it. Uh, you know, if, it's, if you're working over the weekend, they might be okay with it. Um, anyway, so what you could do is you can, 
work with a proxy server and send your request to watch the game through the proxy server and have the proxy server forward your request on to ESPN and then get 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 around the restriction not being able to access ESPN directly that way. Um, this also used to be used to get around the Great Firewall of China. Um, and so the idea would be uh, China blocks access to basically anything that makes the government look bad. So uh, they don't want you to be able to read the New York Times. Uh, they don't want you to be able to read the Washington Post, for example. So if you were in China, you used to be able to get around that by sending the request to get to the New York Times, not directly because we sent it directly the uh, the computers controlling access in and out of China would look at it and say, you're not allowed to access the New York Times. Um, so what it would do, you would do instead is you would access a proxy server and say, proxy server, can you send the request on to the New York Times? And then the proxy server would access the New York Times. New York Times would send the article to the proxy server and the proxy server would send it back through. And as long as the Great Firewall of China was not aware of that particular proxy server. It would not notice the IP number as being a problem. Whereas if it saw the IP address for New York Times, it'd be like, that, that's not allowed. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the Great Firewall of China has gotten more and more sophisticated. Um, and so this is generally not going to work anymore. Um, another issue with the proxy server is that uh, the traffic is not encrypted. So whether you're trying to get around the Great Firewall of China or you're trying to get access to ESPN because you're working over the weekend and you want to listen to the game, big game, um, in both cases, that request is going to go in what's referred to as clear text. So uh, if the firewall is smart enough, it can go ahead and look and say, hey, I see that you're sending this to this IP number I don't know about. That's not ESPN.com. But if I scan the text of your request, I can see that there's a reference to ESPN.com in here, what's going on. Anyway, so that, that is a potential issue with proxy servers. But you know, for things like uh, accessing the resources that Stanford is paid for when you are off campus, proxy servers work great. Okay, um, a more sophisticated situation happens with virtual private networks. Uh, and VPNs can be used for some of the same things as proxy servers, but they can also be used for some other purposes as well. So. Um, let's say uh, we have a company and it has the company intranet and um, that's basically all the traffic in the co corporate intranet. And remember, an intranet is an internal network that uses internet protocols. Um, all the traffic in the corporate intranet is, uh, we're not worrying about that traffic. We're assuming that there is no nobody inside the corporation that is, doing something they shunt that's trying to steal our, our data, our information. But we are concerned with all the information outside, and that's why we have that firewall computer out there. Now, suppose um, we set up a different office in a different location. Um, usually I use Hong Kong as my location, but given the current uh, situation in Hong Kong right now, they may not be the best example, but um, yeah. All right, let's, say, let's use Tokyo. Let's say we set up an office in Tokyo. Uh, and so now the question is, we've got a Palo Alto office and we got our corporate intranet in Palo Alto, and then we have a corporate intranet over in Tokyo. Um, how are we going to connect the two together? And what happens when data is sent from one office to the next office? Well, the safest thing we can do if we're really concerned with security is we lease our own private lines and. Um, the only way somebody can actually eavesdrop in on our conversation is to physically tap into the lines. Now, clearly that, that is technically possible, but uh, to physically tap into the lines, depending on how sophisticated our attackers are. But yeah, that's, that's going to take a fair amount of work. Otherwise, if we don't do that, um, what's going to happen here is when we send information from, say, the Palo Alto office to the Tokyo office, we're going to just use the internet to send the information because that's by far the cheapest thing to do. Renting our own lines or worse yet, laying our own lines is going to be super, super expensive. So we're just going to use the internet. But here's the thing. Let's say we've got uh, two computers sending information through the internet. Uh, one's in our Palo Alto office and one's in our Tokyo office. And so what do people 
outside of our company see when that traffic gets sent? Well, they see everything because it's all being sent with IP packets. And if somebody is between our computer and the computer we're sending it to, they happen to be on that chain uh, or that sequence of uh, computers that our IP packets get sent through. They're going to see everything. They're going to see who the sender is. They're going to see who the recipient is. And unless the contents are explicitly encrypted, they're going to be able to see the contents as well. Now, one thing you could do is you could just encrypt all the information, but um, it's possible just simply knowing who's, computer is sending information to whose computer, they may be able to get a lot of information. So for example, if they know that the CEO is sending a lot of uh, packets to the computer uh, owned by uh, an acquisitions director, they might be like, oh, that company's about to make an acquisition. Let's see how we can take advantage of this. So what you really want to do is, one, you want to make sure that people can't identify which specific computers are sending data to which other specific computers. And then two, in addition, you want the data to always be encrypted um, instead of having to have the people explicitly encrypt their data. And so a virtual private network is going to actually handle both of these. Um, and the way this is going to work is with the virtual private network, when I send information from a computer in one part of the network to a computer in the other part of the network, my information is going to pass through uh, a computer in the DMZ, and that computer is going to encrypt all the information. It's not only going to encrypt the actual data I'm sending, it's also going to encrypt the uh, the IP number of the sender and the IP number of the recipient. It's going to replace the IP number of the sender with itself, and it will replace the IP number of the recipient with its equivalent DMZ computer on the other side. Um, and so then what we're, it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and send that, or the, that packet to the other DMZ computer in, in the Tokyo office. The DMZ computer in the Tokyo office is going to decrypt all the information, um, thus revealing the original sender and the original recipient and uh, decrypting the information in the packet. And then it will get passed on to the, uh, the actual destination computer. So as far as what people on the internet are able to see, they'll see that the two DMZ computers are communicating. So they'll see that the Tokyo office and the Palo Alto office are communicating, but they won't know which specific computers are communicating. They won't be able to identify like what type of communication is taking place. That's another thing that uh, potentially people could see with the other, the other with, without the VPN. It's like, wh what sort of communication is this? Um, and they won't be able to see the contents at all. So a uh, big win. Um, so in addition to allowing us to connect two different offices as if we had one big network without having to worry about what happens when the information travels through the internet, not having to worry about the security there. Um, this can also be done with individual computers. So, you know, if I'm operating from home or uh, I'm out on the road, uh, I'm operating from my hotel, um, the way this would work is my computer would bundle everything up and uh, encrypt it and then send it to the computer in the office and DMZ and then it would be decrypted there. Um, you may also hear about private VPNs. Um, this is a currently a relatively hot topic. Um, and so why would somebody want a personal VPN? Or um, Well, I think probably the main reason why people are getting these is it hides your internet activity from the internet service provider or any other nefarious parties that are out there. Um, and so the idea here is that uh, one of the reasons why you might want to do this is it turns out that the Trump administration has changed the rules so that our ISPs like Comcast can now sell our web browsing information to uh, whoever wants to pay for it. Um, now, most of the major ISPs have promised they won't do that. Although, well, actually, I suppose I was going to say, although given the current circumstances, they may not be doing well financially, they may change their mind. Uh, and that is always a possibility, although I would I would assume that under the current circumstances, internet service providers are probably doing pretty well. I mean, you got to pick a business to be in. Uh, being in a business that supports people working from home is probably a good business to be in. Anyway, so uh, bottom line is 
they are now allowed to sell information on all your internet habits. Um, most of the main internet service providers have, have promised they won't do that, but they are now legally allowed to do that. So maybe you don't want that to happen. And so uh, if you contract with a VPN, what will happen is um, as far as Comcast sees or you know, AT&T or whoever your provider is, they'll just see you're communicating with a VPN. What the ultimate server that you want to talk to is, that's hidden from them. They just see encrypted packets going from you to your VPN. Um, v personal VPNs can also be used to simulate being in a different country. So uh, if the VPN has connections in different countries, you can say, oh, I want to connect to the VPN and pretend I'm in Tokyo, or I want to pretend I'm in Australia. Um, and so what will happen is your information will get bundled up, it'll get sent to uh, the VPN, and uh, and the VPN will have a server in Australia or a server in Tokyo or wherever. Why do you want to do this? Well, one thing it can be used for is, in some cases, you can access information that's regionally locked. So uh, this doesn't work with everybody. Um, so you should poke around and do your research uh, to make sure that the research that you're looking for will allow access by VPNs. And my impression is some VPNs do a bit better than other VPNs, but you know, like maybe um, there's a TV show you really want to watch and it's available in Europe, but it's not available in the U.S. And if you try and access directly from the U.S., they say, hey, that's a U.S. IP number. We aren't licensed to uh, to show this. Uh, to people in the United States. Um, so if your VPN will allow you to pretend that, say, you're in Italy, um, then you just connect to the VPN. Uh, as far as the service provider sees you're coming from Italy, it's like, okay, that's fine. I can go ahead and show you this show. Um, issues with VPN, and this is kind of related, are the VPNs can get blocked by various websites or by various streaming services. So it's possible for the streaming service to be like, this is a VPN. Um, this seems kind of sketchy. I wonder if you're trying to get around our regional locks. I am not going to show you any video. Uh, also, some financial websites will block you. Um, and this is basically because they know VPNs hide where the information is coming from. And they're like, you might be a hacker. This looks kind of sketch. I'm only going to let you in if you are coming from a service provider that I recognize as normally legitimate, like say AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, something like that. Um, another issue with VPNs is there's a greater chance that you are going to run into those annoying CAPTCHAs where you have to type in words or you have to click on, uh, you know, click on the crosswalk things. Um, and that is, again, because the websites are are like, you're coming from a VPN, this is potentially much sketchier than if you're coming from a regular service provider. I wanna make sure that you are a actual human being, not a computer trying to hack the website or a computer trying to perform a distributed denial of service attack. So, you know, prove to me that you're a human being. So, um, while VPNs do have some advantages, personal VPNs do have some advantages, um, they can also cause some problems. Okay, what else can you do? Well, if you want the maximum security for your computing system, you should just use an air gap. An air gap is the term we use when a computer is completely disconnected from the network. So there's a physical, well, this worked better before there was Wi-Fi, but there's a physical gap between your computer and the internet. And uh, this also means you shouldn't have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or anything else that allows you to remotely access it. So just to provide you an example, Let's say Stanford was super concerned about uh, protecting the Stanford grades. Uh, what could they do? Well, they know that there are all sorts of people at Stanford, very Stanford students who could be probably be pretty good hackers. So they're like, we're going to prevent access to the grade database from anywhere on the internet. It's just going to be completely separated. Maybe it's got its own little internal intranet, but that intranet is completely separated from the wider intranet, and there's no way to, to cross that gap without physically showing up. And then what we're going to do is put guard dogs 
around, uh, let's say we'll put an old union in the basement, old union, we'll have guard dogs. We'll have, you know, mean looking people around there. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're going to prevent any access to this computer. Uh, and the only way you can access the grade computer is if you show up, you show your identification card to the guards. Um, they hold the dogs back. Um, my dog right now is sleeping on the floor, completely not paying attention, which is probably good because she probably heard her barking a fair amount. Um, and so that provides pretty good security because, you know, somebody needs to physically be there. Um, and again, just to emphasize, you can't use Wi-Fi, right? Uh, if you if you allow Wi-Fi access and somebody just drives their van near the uh, near the building and they have a bunch of hackers there with laptops and they access the Wi-Fi network, so no Wi-Fi at all. So what's the flip side of this? The flip side is it's a real pain to get anything done with this. So back in the old days, when I submitted everybody's grades, we really had these bubble-like Scantron sheets and we had to fill in all the Scantron details and then we would hand them over to the departmental admin and uh, he or she would take it to uh, the main administration building and they would read it in. So, you know, air gaps give the maximum protection and also provide the maximum amount of inconvenience. Okay, um, we talked about problems with email uh, and there are a number of secure email systems that are out there. It's just that's not what most people use. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you are looking at secure email systems is that there are a variety of potentially competing objectives for secure email systems. So one thing we want is confidentiality. I think pretty much all of them want confidentiality, which means that um, you know people out in the wider internet can't actually see the email. The email is encrypted when it's traveling through the internet. But uh, some of the systems want authentication. So uh, we want to know for sure who sent this particular email. On the other hand, um, and, and that seems like a real obvious thing that, of course, don't all the systems want this? Well, not necessarily, because one of the reasons why you might want a secure email system is, you know, if you're a human rights activist or, uh, you know, you're a whistleblower or something like that, you want to be able to send email securely to somebody but you don't necessarily want it to be easily identifiable who you are. So um, in some cases, you really want authentication. And in other cases, you want really want anonymity and privacy. Uh, and in fact, some of the secure email systems really tout that they keep no record of the IP addresses of the people who are sending the information. Um, so again, depending upon what you're doing, you might really want that IP address to verify that this person really is who they say they are, or you might want a system where, no, you know, if you're a whistleblower, go ahead and send me an email, like maybe I work for uh, the Washington Post. I want a system where people can go ahead and feel free that they can send information to me and it will be completely confidential. Um, one issue that comes up is who has the ability to decrypt the information? Is the information decrypted on the server? Does the server have access to the keys? So these are all issues that can come up, particularly in situations where, you know, maybe you're in a country where you're concerned with you're sending information about um, things that should not be going on or human rights violations, and you're concerned that the government will figure out who you are and uh, come down on you. And so these are different things that you, sh you can be concerned about. You might be concerned about, like, if that information is on the server and they get uh, a subpoena, um, are people going to be able to decrypt the messages or is that completely safe because they, even the company storing the data does not have the keys to decrypt it? Okay, um, I mentioned this a couple times before, but uh, you know, be aware that there's HTTP, which is the standard version of HTTP, and then there's HTTPS, which is a secure version. With, with a standard regular HTTP, data to and from a web server is sent in what's referred to as clear text. That means it is not encrypted. With HTTPS, traffic to and from the server is encrypted. Um, some web servers don't encrypt all related data. And so most often, I think the, the 
the images might not be encrypted. Um, sometimes the CSS might not be encrypted. And this may trigger a warning from your web browser. So your web browser may say, hey, you've got an HTTPS connection, but be aware that it's not all being encrypted. So typically that's going to mean that there's some, uh, some of the uh, additional items associated with the web page and may not be encrypted. It also could mean like maybe there's a... Uh, a iframe, we talked about iframes last lecture, you know, maybe, so the, I mean, there's a variety of different situations. So ideally, you, you, you don't want that to happen, you want everything to be encrypted. Um, and so along the same lines, um, some websites support both HTTP and HTTPS, but they don't use HTTPS, because it's expensive. Basically, that encryption is expensive, it requires processing power. And so they say, we're not going to actually. I don't know what that means. All right, that was fun. Whatever I just said triggered Siri. Um, so encryption is uh, expensive. It takes processing power to actually encrypt things. And so that increases their cost because that means they need more computing power. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why they wouldn't necessarily encrypt everything. Um, one thing that you may want to get is there's a plugin from the EFF Foundation um, called HTTPS Everywhere. And this plugin will force use of HTTPS when it's available. So it'll basically be like, no, I really want HTTPS. And as long as HTTPS is available on the server, all information will be sent with HTTPS. Uh, another thing that you might want to do is disable JavaScript. It turns out that um, so for a while, I had a, a security PhD student who was my TA uh, for CS105, and this was one of his biggest suggestions. He said, you know, if, if you want to be safe computing on the internet, you know, the biggest thing that you can do is you can disable JavaScript. Um, so th the issue here is client-side JavaScript can be used in a variety of different malicious ways. Uh, you know, like we talked about the... Uh, the drive-by download, uh, that's often triggered by JavaScript. Um, sometimes there's uh, holes in the web browser security that JavaScript can, can sort of manipulate. Uh, so basically, disabling JavaScript will greatly increase your security. On the other hand, it will also make life potentially pretty annoying. Uh, it makes things annoying because many web pages require JavaScript for actual use. Um, and so uh, I'll show you the tools in just a second, but a bunch of these tools will allow you to whitelist certain websites. Um, so you can say, well, when I'm on the New York Times, I trust New York Times to not do anything they shouldn't. So I'm going to go ahead and put that on the whitelist. Um, I would say definitely if you go to any sketchy websites uh, ever, you should turn off JavaScript. Um, and even if you aren't going to sketchy websites, it turns out occasionally the standard advertising networks will somehow allow somebody to put up stuff out as advertisements on the standard advertising networks that uh, use JavaScript to do some sketchy stuff. So that's that's kind of problematic. Um, so I actually do disable JavaScript for web browsing, but again, it, it is kind of a pain. But yeah, you know, that was that was the number one recommendation from my security expert. So, uh, okay, so how do you actually do this? There's a bunch of plugins. The plugin for Firefox is NoScript, and um, I believe SafeScript is the plugin for Chrome. Uh, and the way this is going to work is when you go visit a particular web page, if that web page has uh, JavaScript associated with it. The JavaScript won't run. Sometimes this will end up just giving you a blank web page. Um, uh, most notably, I think Forbes will not allow, will not even display anything if you're running JavaScript um, because they're using JavaScript for their advertising. Uh, anyway, so uh, what you need to do is there's going to be a little indicator telling you that JavaScript is blocked. And so you can kind of look at that little icon and see how much JavaScript associated with web page is being blocked. And then what you can do is if you click on it, it will provide a list of the actual JavaScript files that this web page is trying to access. And you can turn some of them off and turn some of them on. And so you'd be like, 
well, clearly I need to allow Canvas to access JavaScript, but um, I see there's this advertising network. Uh, you know, I do know that sometimes the advertising networks do send some sketchy stuff. Uh, another suggestion that some people have is to use no ads, but I, I don't feel comfortable with that because I do realize that there's a lot of these independent websites. That's the only way they're paying their bills. So uh, I leave the ads on, but if the ads are using JavaScript, that gets a little bit sketchier. And uh, yeah, anyway, so, um, so this is the way no scripts or safe script works. Basically uh, you can whitelist a bunch of these. You can say, Oh, um, scripts that are coming from such and such a website, that's always fine, but otherwise I want you to ask. Um, I do recommend it, but it is kind of a pain. So one possibly, like I actually run two web browsers. Like I have one web browser that I only use to access my bank, uh, and my email and that's it. And then any other web browsing I either do on my iPads, which again, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm much less worried about the iPad because it is more of a walled garden. Uh, it's harder for people to break out of that. Or I access it from a web browser that has no scripts on. Okay, another issue that comes up, multi-factor authentication. Um, the idea of multi-factor authentication is when you're logging into a website, in addition to knowing your name and your password, you should have some additional factors. Uh, and so what are these different factors? Well, one factor is something that you know, that would typically be your password. Another potential factor is something you have, such as a cell phone or uh, some sort of a security token. Uh, another possible factor is something you are, like this is you or yourself, but like you have a, uh, a fingerprint, you have your retinal pattern. Um, so something that's unique about you because of who you are. Um, and so the idea is you should have at least two of these in order to access a, um, a website or, you know, a, a remote resource. And so the idea here is if your password leaks and somebody has your name and your password, unless they have this extra factor here, um, they won't be able to access your uh, your information or your banks or banking accounting or whatever. So um, I strongly recommend on any website that you can, you turn on multi-factor authentication, uh, particularly email. Remember your email is your keys to everything. If somebody gets access to your email account, ultimately that means they also has access to your, your financial information because your financial information is probably tied to your email account. Uh, they can go ahead and reset the password and bang, it'll send it the new password information to uh, to your email. So your email is the key to everything. Keep that super, super secure. Uh, and then of course, financial websites. Um, and so typically email and financial websites will allow you to turn on two-factor authentication. I strongly, strongly recommend you, you do it. The most common two-factor authentication is sending a text message to your phone. So going back to what we said before, you know, something you know, your password, but in addition, something you have, you have your cell phone. Uh, therefore, it's not a hacker because they wouldn't have your cell phone. Um, they might be able to get your password somehow, uh, but they won't have your cell phone. Now, there is a bit of a problem with this because it turns out the SMS system is not secure. That's the text messaging, the standard text messaging system. Uh, Apple internal iMessaging is much more secure than the standard uh, cell phone messages system. Um, SMS traffic is not encrypted and it's possible to spoof the system and to pretend to be something that you aren't. So that's kind of pro problematic. Um, in addition, hackers and scammers have started stealing people's telephone numbers so basically they claim to be you and get a new phone and get that phone directed and have cell phone messages to your phone actually sent to that new phone uh, instead of to your cell phone. So that's all pretty problematic. Um, on the other hand, you know, if, if this isn't a determined attacker trying to attack you specifically, this is somebody who got a list of a whole bunch of passwords from somewhere, um, this will still probably be pretty good. So you know, if your choices are do this text messaging based two-factor authentication or no two-factor authentication at all, 
do the text-based two-factor authentication. It's way better than not having two-factor authentication. Uh, so what's the alternative? Well, some websites support a additional alternative method of uh, multi-factor authentication using something called an authenticator. Uh, now, this can be a physical device that displays numbers on it uh, at random intervals, or it could be a cell phone app. Um, they both basically do the same thing. And so they are creating what are referred to as pseudo-random numbers. So they look like they're random numbers, but they aren't actually random numbers. Uh, what they actually are is they are a sequence of numbers generated based on a seed number. And so as long as you start with the same seed number, you will receive the same sequence of pseudo-random numbers after the initial seed. And so the idea here is if your uh, cell phone app or your physical authentication device starts with the same seed number as the web server that you're trying to communicate with, you will both be able to generate the same sequence of numbers that look like they're random, but they're actually pseudo random and they will match exactly. Um, now, it turns out that uh, the websites actually use a slightly different technique, combining both this idea of a pseudo random number along with the current time. Um, but it's basically the same sort of idea. You start off with a seed, there's a sequence, it takes the seed, that's the sequence and the current time into account. And based on that, it can generate a number and it will be the exact same number as somebody else who started off with the same seed and uh, knows what the current time is. Um, and so that's the way these work. And the idea is that only you have that seed and the web server has that seed. And if some hacker has your account, even if they've uh, stolen your telephone number, but hopefully not your phone, um, then, uh, you know, those those numbers will uniquely match and there's no way somebody else that didn't know what the random, the initial random seed was uh, would be able to reproduce it. Um, it's also possible to use biometrics. Um, this was the something you are that we saw with the, the, the possible factor. So something you know, something you have, or something you are. Um, so this could be like fingerprints or retinal eye pattern. Uh, Security experts seem kind of like not so hot on this idea. Um, I have heard some people say, well, if it's an additional factor, that's fine, but it should not be the only factor. And so one of the problems is that you can't change it. So like once your retinal eye pattern is out there, it's out there. Um, once somebody knows what your fingerprint looks like, they know what your fingerprint looks like. And, you know, it's potentially possible to fake out these systems if you know what the fingerprint looks like. Um, and so, uh, just as an example of how your fingerprints get out there, well, the United States Office of Personal Management, this is the, uh, bureau that's responsible for, among other things, doing security checks, got hacked and over 21 million people's fingerprints were stolen. So great. Um, and I know I have fingerprints that are registered with the state of California because, I teach high school students during the summer. So everybody that teaches summer school, you need to get your fingerprints registered. Um, and so, you know, do I trust, uh, I, I don't know where they're being stored. I don't know who's responsible for their storage, but like, do I trust them not to get hacked? Do I trust them not to get hacked enough to trust my bank account to them? Eh. So uh, that that is the problem with biometrics. Okay, some things to be thinking about as far as your passwords go. There's a number of possible concerns with passwords. The first one is passwords can be brute force. So this means trying all the possible combinations. And it's been interesting watching as people were like, oh, eight character long passwords are fine. No, now you need nine character long passwords. And basically what's been going on here is the faster and faster computers get, the less amount of time it's gonna take for somebody to uh, try all the different combinations. Anyway, longer passwords are better than shorter passwords because each additional character requires, you know, a huge number of additional uh, possibilities. And so they need to try a lot more if they're doing brute force attack. In addition, if you use both uppercase letters and lowercase letters, again, that increases the number of possible combinations. Um, if you include digits 
and punctuations. Not all websites allow you to use punctuations, which is kind of annoying. But if you use digits and punctuation, that will even more greatly increase the number of combinations. So if you want to maximize the difficulty of somebody guessing your password by just brute forcing, trying all the different possible combinations, uh, use uppercase letters, lowercase letters, digits, and punctuations. Um, also, you know, I said the main thing is the length of the password, but uh, attackers also have a list of the most common password used. So like, don't come up with something really cutesy that like maybe other people also use because that's probably on the list of the most common passwords. And these are things that the attacker will try first. Um, use different passwords for different websites. Why? Well, the first thing is like, if you've got a bunch of random hobby websites, uh, do you know who owns that website? Do you trust who owns that website? Do you trust them, one, to not be a hacker? But also, two, do you trust their computer security? Are they going to keep their computer security updated? So just, just to provide you an example, um, one of my passwords is out there in the wild. There, there are lists that you can use to check and see if your passwords are out there. Uh, and it turns out it got uh, stolen from a website called TitanQuest.net. TitanQuest was a... Uh, uh, video games similar to some of you may have seen Diablo or played Diablo. It's kind of like Diablo except for uh, a little bit more classic Greek uh, Greek themed. Um, and yeah, so I created an account on that website and they got hacked and uh, that password is out there in the wild. Um, and even professional websites do get hacked. For example, the PlayStation Network a while back got hacked. Uh, there have been a variety of other people that have gotten hacked. So um, ideally, if they know what they're doing, uh, if they get hacked, hopefully your password should still be uh, protected because it's referred to what's called um, hashed. But, uh, but, you know, they don't always do, the, don't always follow good, safe computing practices. So if they get probably increases the chances they're going to ha get hacked if they're already uh, not providing safe computing practices and then they get hacked and that password is now out there. And in fact, Stanford says you should not use the Stanford password on any other uh, website. But you definitely want different passwords. Like do not use your financial passwords on a random websites. a really bad idea. And again, reminder, your Email account is the keys to the kingdom. So, you know, don't use that password on anything else either. Um, some experts suggest using a passphrase instead of a password. And so a passphrase is essentially a bunch of words strung together. Um, so uh, the idea here is that passphrases are easy to remember. So like if you're like, uh, I don't know, cardinal computer, Flomo, hopefully you can remember that because Flomo is the best dorm on campus and obviously Cardinal is really great. And I already forgot what my middle word was, but it's easier than a random sequence of 12 uppercase, lowercase digits punctuation. And the idea here is that what you can do with the passphrase is you can make the passphrase a lot longer. Uh, so, you know, if you've got 12 random characters versus you have a sequence of four words stuck together, which end up being 25 characters. Well, 25 characters is a lot of random combinations to come up with. Um, and since there are over 50,000 words in the English language, even if they know that there are four words, there's a heck of a lot of combinations in order to do that. Um, unfortunately, research shown, has shown that passphrases aren't as random as they should be. Um, this is from Bonet and Chitova. I, I mentioned Bonet and Chitova because Joe Bonet uh, was a former student who I wrote a letter of rec that got him to grad school. And I ran into, uh, I was reading up on passphrases and I ran into his uh, research. I was like, go Joe. Um, anyway, uh, so basically what they found was that uh, people are not coming up with random passphrases. They're coming up with phrases that fall specific rules. They have grammatical rules. They're, you know, um, and so the idea here is that if the passphrases are not actually completely a sequence of four completely random uh, words, then you are not getting full advantage of the idea that passphrases are longer, but they're safer. 
And in fact, it greatly reduces the security on passphrases. I think they're still generally considered, even if you have four not completely random words. Um, I mean, if you come with a common phrase, you're screwed. But uh, in general, if there are four semi-random words, um, you still should have pretty good security. But just be aware, you really want to pick stuff that's completely random. You don't want to be like, oh, this is a cool set of words that completely make sense together that other people might also come up with. That's, that's a really bad idea. Okay, another possibility is a password manager. Uh, so password manager is going to keep track of all your passwords. Uh, it will come up with new passwords for you, which are completely randomized and are of nice, good length. Um, and the basic idea here is you have a master password that gets you into the password manager. And then once you've done that, you don't need to remember any of your other passwords. Um, password managers are also really nice because they protect you from phishing attacks. So you recall... You know, phishing attacks is when you get something like an email claiming to be from your bank, you click on it, it takes you to a website that looks exactly like your bank. What the password manager is going to do is it could be like, uh, your bank is Bank of America. This is Bank or America. It looks really close, but it's a different name. I'm not going to enter in your password information here. Now, what you need to do is if, well, first of all, don't ever click on the links. That's still true whether or not you're running a password manager or not. But like, um, you know, if you go to a website that you think you have a password for in your password manager and it doesn't get filled out automatically, you should double check and be like, huh, I wonder why my password manager doesn't like this. Like, is it that I misspelled it and this is a hacker's website or like what's going on here? So I do think that the, this is a big advantage of using the password managers that, uh, they should help prevent uh, phishing where um, somebody's trying to act like it's a website that, you know, in order to get your login information because the password manager is going to be like, that's not the right website. I have the password for the real website and that is not the real website and I'm not going to autofill in the information. Where if you're glancing at that website, you might be like, well, it looks like my real website. I guess I'm going to go ahead and type my information in password manager won't do that um the one potential downside is the password managers there are a there have been a number of security incidents with password managers including one of them which got completely hacked so i don't know if there's any great solutions but um but the security experts do seem to think that the password managers are a good idea in general so uh you know i i tend to listen to the experts on this all right um so there's one last lecture on security, which is going to be super short, which is just going to be a quick summary of uh, suggestions for personal security, including some of the ones that we just covered here on passwords. I'll talk to you all soon.